Hi, this is Mary Greengale, and it's campaign season. Candidates are starting to be interviewed. And I want you to understand that when I interview these candidates, I am asking each candidate for an office the same questions. They get the questions in advance. They can prepare. And then we go through them. I have found this to be a good way to get a sense of how people respond to the questions in substance and also how they differ between one candidate to another. The other thing for candidates that are not opposed, I do not do interviews, but if they are brand new to town government, I do. And I do so because I believe that people have the right to know who's running their town government. And so we meet them, we talk to them, and we ask them a series of questions that's appropriate for their town office. So you will be able to watch these interviews at your leisure and um, keep an eye out for them. And let's get going. Hi, Mary Greendale here with Just Thinking, and I'm interviewing a candidate for school committee by the name of Karen DeMortica. How are you, Karen? I'm Did well, I how are you? Thank you. Did I pronounce your name properly? Uh, so uh, Demotica. Demotica. No R in it. Or if there is, you don't pronounce it. Okay. Um, so Karen, please tell us a bit about yourself. Um, so uh, my name is Karen Demotica. I am living here in Ashland. I mean, in Holliston. I work in Ashland. <laughs> um, I'm a third grade teacher. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, I teach third grade there in Ashland. I have been there for about eight years. Um, we moved here roughly nine years ago. Um, we came from the city. We lived in Malden before then. Um, so, you know, pretty much I live here with my husband and my four children. Um, you know, we love it here. We like that, you know, it's quiet. It's a we live in the Queens, so it's a really great neighborhood. There's lots of kids, um, lots of great neighbors and families. So we really have enjoyed living here. It is a great little neighborhood. I left it. I was there for 20 years. So um, how long have you been teaching? Um, I have been teaching for um, eight years. So I, my undergrad is in psychology. Um, that, that's what I originally went to school for. And then I went back to school when my Two older boys were little, um, and I got what is called a post-baccalaureate from Framingham State, and that allowed me to obtain my um, my teaching license um, in uh, one through six elementary. I didn't work at first. I was home, um, and then I had my third, and I went back to work when he was probably about two, and I have my master's in um, English as a second language, so I did that after. Okay. So, um, were the schools a consideration in your deciding to move to Holliston? Yes, they were actually a really big consideration when we moved here. So my oldest son is on an IEP. He's been on an IEP since he was three. So, um, the school system was actually a major decision for us in why we moved here. And why do you want to run for the school committee now? Um, so I guess it's always kind of been, you know, for the last couple of years, something in the back of my mind of something that I would like to do. I guess I feel like school committee is somewhat in my wheelhouse of being able to give back to the community. I understand how the school system works. I mean, I have, you know, four kids going through the school system. Um, you know, so I kind of have that perspective of a parent. I have that perspective of a teacher. And you know, there's no one specific thing that I could say that this is why I'm running for school committee. Um, it's really just a, a way of, you know, giving back to the community of, you know, doing what's best for kids, doing what's best for teachers. And that's really, you know, my reason for doing it is that it's all about, it's all about the kids. Okay. Um, describe the specific skills or experience that you would bring to the school committee job. Um, so I guess, you know, one of the biggest would be that I am a teacher. So I understand how the school systems work and I understand how things are implemented and things that come down. And when you're making decisions, you know, you have to think in, you know, kind of like broad spectrum, like you need to think of how it impacts the kids. You need to think about how it impacts the teachers. And at the end of the day, you really need to kind of, you know, 
figure out a balance of how to do best for both. Really, the kids are, you know, kind of the number one generally everywhere, at least in my mind. Um, I also have four children, and my children span a large gamut. So my oldest is 16, and my youngest is four. So I don't really, I have a four-year-old, I have a 10-year-old, I have a 14-year-old, and I have a 16-year-old. So they're kind of everywhere from preschool to high school. So I don't really have that, you know, I have to think of when I'm, you know, trying to think of how things impact. It's really across the gamut of how things are going to impact, you know, how's it going to impact the high schoolers? How's it going to impact the little guys? How's it going to impact, you know, those middle schoolers? So I really think that being able to think in, you know, all age brackets is really beneficial because, you know, it's hard. Sometimes when you're either in it or you're out of it, it can be, you know, difficult to either think back or try to look ahead. Um, and I feel like me being in all of it right now. <laughs> <laughs> and you are. <laughs> so in, in the time that you've been here then and your children have been in the schools, uh, have you seen any changes that either improvements or declines or have they pretty much stayed the same? And don't take into account COVID because we know that just can't. Right, right, right. Um, I don't necessarily know as if I would say there's been a huge change. Um, I think that each of my kids, their needs have been different. And I think that the schools have done a good job at, you know, really kind of accommodating the needs that they have. You know, we've run into some bumps along the way, which I think you're going to, that's going to happen no matter where you are. Um, so I think overall, it's been a really good experience for us. You know, I wouldn't say that, you know, they've changed, you know, a lot since we've been here, you know, the schools, I know that some of the curriculum has changed. Um, so they're trying to make improvements in that area, at least at the elementary level. Um, and then I would say, you know, some of the changes that I see really are based on my kids and not necessarily on the schools themselves. Cause like I said, they have you know, different needs and their experiences are, are, are different because of their personalities. What do you think are the school's uh, two biggest assets? Uh, school's two biggest assets. I think they're teachers. Um, I can't say that I have, none of my kids have ever had the same teacher. And I can say, um, I take that back, except for middle school, they've had a couple of teachers that have um, crossed over but none of them have had the same elementary school teacher. You know, they've had, you know, different middle school teachers and they are just fantastic. I can't say that there was one that I disliked or one that I thought was, oh, you know, I wish he had had, you know, a different one. So they have been amazing and, I, and they have really been probably the biggest asset. And I would also say that... Um, there's kind of something for everyone. So having, you know, different programs, you know, that they offer Montessori, French immersion, traditional, you know, there are different things and different options for students. Okay. What do you think of the two limitations, liabilities or however we want? Limitations and liabilities. So I think, ooh, that's a hard one. Limitations. Ah, uh, you know, I guess a big limitation is probably the lack of diversity. Um, and there's only so much as a community that you can, you know, really do about that. Um, and maybe bringing in more diversity in other ways through, um, you know, different programs or through different, you know, extracurricular types of things or even, um, you know, bringing in different arts into the school that, you know, that they're able um, to witness. And then I would say, I don't know if I can really think of another one offhand, you know, of a liability of the school or, you know, something that I've really enjoyed. How about, enjoyed. Hurdles? How about we hurdle? hurdle? Hurdles, two of the, two of the um, So hurdles, so one of the hurdles that I would say that I faced for one of my children is, I think that when you get to the upper, upper levels, some of the upper levels, I think that we need to really kind of reassess some of our, um, our policy on bullying and what classifies and constitutes bullying and how we go about like investigating 
bullying. I think that it's a really hard thing to um, navigate and manage. I think for a lot of, especially at the middle school level, I think there's certain things that are happening and it's really hard for the administration to, um, I guess, figure out what's happening because of the way that they, the protocols and, you know, kind of the definitions that they have for bullying in place, you know, it leaves a lot to be desired. And I think that there are ways that we could improve and, um, you know, it, it was, a, it was a really, it, there are things that are lacking, I guess, in that area, I would say. All right. That's good. Well, it's, it's important that you have a clear handle on what it is that, you know, how it's affected your family and you can take that to, to the job. I mean, that's right. part yes. of the advantage of having a child in the system at the time that you're serving. So bearing in mind that you're only one of seven members, so you cannot magically go in there and wave some wand and have everything mm -hmm. fixed. What's the one thing that you'd like to um, hope to accomplish in your first term and how will you measure success? Um, so I thought a lot about this question and I guess um, the hardest part that I found in answering this question was that there wasn't any one specific reason that I was running. Um, but I think if I had to focus on what's happening right now at this given point in time um, with the pandemic and everything that there is for students, I would really like us to focus on a lot of the social emotional for students. There's this big push to have kids come back to school, which I, I mean, I am so excited to have all of my students in my classroom right now. That is like, you know, I walk in with a smile on my face every day because I'm excited to see them um, and to be with them. And, you know, but I think that it would be um, misguided for us to think that there are not a lot of social emotional hurdles that these kids are going to have to overcome in the next few years, you know, facing, having lived through this or living through this pandemic, being home from school, some kids that haven't stepped foot in the building, you know, the, the students that are choosing to be remote and, or their families are choosing for them to be remote. And then when they finally have to step foot back into a building, the amount of anxiety, the amount of stress that that is going to impose on them and how that's gonna impact their education and their learning. And because it absolutely does, you know, their social emotional well being is such a huge part of their success. Um, so I guess how that could be measured would be, you know, how well students are doing emotionally, which means that how they're able to cope in school and how they're able to adjust in school and making sure that we have things in place for them, you know, whether it's extra guidance counselors or, and that comes into a whole other you know, ball game, but whatever it is that we need to do to put into place for these students to make sure that they're not feeling anxious and they're feeling comfortable and they know that they're safe and that, you know, it's okay to be here because that's really a concern for many students. Even some students that have been hybrid for so long now having everybody in their class. No, I think that is a real issue. And, and I wonder if, um, it, you know, has Ashley done anything that you've been impressed by or have they raised an issue or have they brought any, brought forth any ideas about how they're going to approach some of these? Um, so, so we talk about it a lot. Um, so within the classroom, I do um, check-ins with my kids. Um, I have certain ones that I know that are anxious. So those kids that I know that are anxious, um, I check in with them in the morning. I communicate with their parents a lot to see, you know, kind of where they're at. I give them all. So we have like little silent communication that we use so that in case they need to get up and go for a walk because they're feeling anxious or if they need to go and talk to the guidance counselor. So I try to make sure that I set up something so that everybody doesn't know, you know, what's happening with them, but it's kind of like a silent communication between us. Um, our guidance counselors are coming in once a week and doing um, social emotional lessons with them, kind of teaching them how to recognize their feelings and, you know, giving them options and suggestions of things that they can do when they're recognizing that they're feeling anxious or, you know, if they're in the blue zone or the green zone or the red zone or the yellow zone, you know, so we kind of, um, you know, categorize it that way and different strategies that they can use when they're feeling that way and who they can talk to. And we've done surveys with them of to make sure that they have a trusted adult in the building, 
And, you know, in my classroom, it might be me, but it might be the guidance counselor. It might be, you know, another adult, but making sure that we know who that trusted adult is for them. So if something's happening, we can, you know, get them in contact with them. That all sounds very good. Sounds very good. So right now, you know that we're in a fair amount of contention with the um, teachers union over the negotiations and so yes. forth. I'm confident in saying that neither side is enjoying the experience. I imagine not. <laughs> oh, I, I think uh, we can both just hope that it's all resolved soon and it won't be an issue. But have you ever been involved in a similar kind of situation where everything is just so tense and, um, you know, kind of... <sighs> I, I, I like for like professionally, no. Um, so we had contract negotiations last year as well. Um, and you know, there was some, there was back and forth. We ended up, um, we ended up tabling certain issues and, and opting to wait until this year. We wanted to get through this year. And so we opted to, as a union to table certain things until, we kind of saw what this year would bring. And then, you know, so we've just started back up with negotiations as well. Um, but I think that, you know, it's hard on, you know, either side. I know that the last contract negotiation that we went through, it wasn't, I wouldn't say it was really contentious. There are things that we were asking for that, you know, we had to, you know, it was a long haul. So our representatives did a really good job and they communicated with us well, but I wasn't necessarily in the room part of, you know, the negotiations. And I feel like we all did a really good job of trying to remain positive. So I think that that's, you know, kind of one of the big things of when you're in that contentious situation is being able to, being able to see the other side like understanding where they're coming from, being even agree or disagree, being able to see somebody else's perspective and see somebody else's side and where they're coming from and understand that, you know, whether you agree or not, they're coming from a place that they think that this is what's best. And if you can kind of go in with that attitude of understanding that, you know, they're not doing it to be spiteful and, and mean. They're really trying to do what they think is best for their union, best for, you know, the other teachers that are working. Um, I think it makes it easier to deal with those types of situations. Mm. Yeah, well, unfortunately, there's just no easy way to get past this kind of thing. And, and it all depends on the personalities of the people who are sitting in the room at the time. You know. Yes, I agree. So I would hope that, you know, I could be one of those personalities that is, you know, very you positive, know, and positive and middle of the road and, you know, kind of trying to allow people to really listen and hear what the other people are saying. Well, hearing is hard sometimes. So yes. if you were, if you could wave a magic wand and have the power and authority to go ahead and deal with the question of hazard pay for teachers, what would you do with that? So this is a hard one, I found, because for me as a teacher, but I teach elementary school, so I have the same 24 kids every single day, and they don't leave my room. I mean, we go to lunch. They leave my room to go to lunch, um, and they eat in the cafeteria, and they're spaced six feet apart, and our specialists come into the room. So other than lunch and recess, we're in our, I'm in my own little bubble with my kids all day. Um, but then you have the nurses who are dealing with all of the students that are sick all the time. And you have high school teachers that are switching, you know, have, you know, hundreds of kids that they're seeing on a regular basis. Um, so I don't, I'm not, if I could make like wave a magic wand, I don't know what I would do. I would need more information. I would want to know about community spread. I would want to know, you know, how is it impacting students within the community? How is it impacting teachers within the community? You know, are, you know, how many cases have there been of teachers contracting from students? Um, I guess I would want to have all of the information, um, because I guess when I think of hazard pay, I think in terms of, it, it, it almost kind of makes me think of like the military and hazard pay. And so 
I guess the more information I had, the better I would be able to answer that question. I think we would all like to be able to ma- wave a magic wand and say, sure, let's, you know, give, you know, teachers everything and anything that they want. You know, they really, they're all doing such a phenomenal job, you know, here in Holliston, they really are. I guess I just don't know what, um, without all of the information, how I would, you know, make that decision. I feel like you need to have all of the information before you can, you know, really give a definitive answer. Well, you raise a good point. And so as a member of the school committee, what, I mean, this may land on your desk at some point only because with the federal funds that come down and so it's possible Mm -hmm. even disregarding the the issue um, the uh, negotiations or anything just as, as a sidebar issue yep. hazard pay could be taken care of through federal, federal ARPA funds or the CARES Act funds that are mm-hmm. left and so, so I think it's Michigan right now they're mailing checks I think it's like $500 checks to teachers for hazard pay interesting yeah, I haven't heard what they're ultimately going to do here either with first responders, the EMTs, with the police department. I know all of that is on the table in different locations in town. But yeah, that's a it's 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 a loaded question, you know. It's because there, I, I guess for me, like I, I again, without all of the information in front of me, it, I feel like it would be hard to. I have to say, you know, kind of which way I would lean on that. I guess for me as a teacher, as a third grade teacher, I don't feel like I'm at risk right now. And that's, I mean, I'm vaccinated, you know, my kids are six feet apart from me, you know, they're three feet from each other, but they stay in their desks and, you know, we follow all of the protocols that are in place. Mm -hmm. Um, But that's me. You could ask, you know, somebody that's in a classroom next to me and they're going to feel completely different. Well, and especially if they have health issues or have someone it, health issues that really ratchet up the anxiety. Yes, absolutely. If you have, you know, underlying health conditions, if you have people at home that are, you know, that are sick, if your anxiety is through the roof, there's there's so many things to take into account, you know. Unfortunately, I don't think it's one of those things that one size fits all, and yet that's probably how it's being approached, you know, so... Um, I would agree. I would agree. So it, it's definitely one of those things that's going to end up a one size fits all, but it's maybe not necessarily one of those things that, you know, particularly is a one size fits all. So I know my answer is so vague and it's not a one way or the other, but I guess, you know, I feel like it's just not a very cut and dry answer. I don't think me. it is. I don't think it is, but what it does do is it helps people understand your thought process. What are you going to think about when you face an issue like that, it helps to your viewers understand, you know, okay, what's she going to think about? And clearly you thought pretty broadly, you know, some people might look at it a little more narrowly, who knows? But anyway, right. I will give you a, a couple of minutes to do a closing statement on why you want people to vote for you on May 25th. So take it away. Well, so I would love for people to vote for me on May 25th because I am very excited to be able to serve as a school committee member. This is definitely a big way to give back to the community that does so much all the time. You know, our school systems are amazing and our teachers are amazing. And so I would love to be able to serve our community and um, really do what's best for kids and teachers. Hey, all right, that was very succinct. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wish you luck. Um, both in the in that and in life in general. So, Thank you so uh, much. Okay. And uh, thanks all. We'll uh, get you for the next candidate. All righty. Thanks. Thank you.